Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equality. You have ex executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his de decrease and the statue that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger to those their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. We're going to spend today in Exodus in one encounter, one of the many encounters of Moses and God. Uh, before we get to the scripture, there I love biblical cartoons. I don't, right or wrong, I love them. And the one that I saw this week reminded me of, of this passage. Moses is encountering God because he, he's very upset that he, and he's very weary about the fact that God is going to walk with them as they walk through the desert. And it shows Moses leading the Israelites, and they're all in a line, and, all, and there's little uh, conversation bubbles from the Israelites, and it says, recalculating, recalculating, <laughs> make a U-turn, and Moses goes, will you please shut those off? <laughs> the first GPS, the first GPS. Moses is very upset in this passage because he's not, he's not seeing the presence of God. He's not physically feeling the presence of God, and he's very, he's un, he doesn't know if God is going to continue walking with them as they go forward. So let's, let's read this encounter and read how Moses talks to God and how God responds to Moses. This is Exodus 33, 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, see You've said to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you've also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. God says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and, and I, your people unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord's, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft on that rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I love the encounter there. Moses wants so badly to see the face of God. Moses wants so badly to experience that, to know exactly who God is and what God is going to do. One of my favorite scenes from the movie, movie and play, musical first, Les Miserables, 
is the, the, the part at the beginning, if you're familiar with this story, the main character, Jean Valjean, uh, escapes from prison after being mostly wrongly imprisoned for many, many years, and he's trying to find a way for a new life. And so Jean Valjean, this, this man, um, was in prison for stealing a loaf of bread for his family, regardless. He makes his way to a monastery, and um, he encounters a priest there, and the priest shows mercy to him. Didn't have any reason to, but the priest let him in. The priest gave him food, gave him shelter, gave him some money. In the middle of the night, Jean Valjean steals a bunch of the priest's items or the church's items, the candles, the, the silverware, things like that, and, and Jean Valjean runs out of the monastery. Now he's caught by the police and he comes back and the police bring him back to the, the priest and said, do you see what this man did? He, he stole all your stuff. He stole your good, good silverware. He stole, and the priest, in, instead of pressing charges, says, Jean Valjean, you forgot the really good stuff. You forgot the great china. You forgot the great silverware and, the, and these silver candlesticks. Here, put these in your bag. And officers, don't arrest this man. Let him go. Let him go. And Victor Hugo, in his novel, which I don't think is included in the recent movie, essentially says, the priest says to Jean Valjean after that encounter, says, don't waste this. Don't waste this moment. You've been given a gift. Now what are you going to do with that? And in my mind, the whole play and the whole musical wraps it up at the end during one of the songs when the the very famous line says, to love another person is to see the face of God. To love another person is to see the face of God. And I think he was referring back to that, that priest that gave him new life, that gave him another chance. To love another person is to see the face of God. Moses is trying desperately to lead these people so they could see the face of God. But that just wasn't what God had intended. It wasn't what God had intended. In this passage from Exodus, we're reminded that it's not that easy to see God's face. We're reminded that the love and the sight of God's face is a very powerful one, that there's a connection between love and the sight of God. But however, God is eternally mysterious. And God's face isn't all that clear. As much as I love the poetry of the words from the play, it represents an imperfect attempt to articulate a true experience of God. This passage tells us we can never see God's face. We can never see God's face. We might catch glimpses of God in the magnificent miracles that we see around us, as well as some of the ones that aren't so obvious. We sense the presence of God within relationships that we've built that nourish and sustain us. And the beauty of nature for some people, that's where they they sense the presence of God. But we do not see a literal, physical body of God, even though we might wish to. Exodus 33 makes it clear that it's just not going to happen. Does God even have a literal body or a face? Have you ever thought about that? We throw that out to the kids and it's really funny, as Roz mentioned. As I've gotten, I'm turning into my father, as I've gotten older, I've come to know, that's my dad's phrase, well, as I've gotten older, I've come to to the understanding that, that God is much more incomprehensible than I had thought. Even in language, we talked about this in Sunday school not that long ago, language is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool to use to describe God, but nevertheless, It's an inadequate tool to describe God because God is so much more than even the words that we have. I guess as a preacher, one of the best things that I feel like I can do for a congregation is get out of the way and let the mystery of God speak for itself. The best preachers that I've ever seen use a sermon and a message to to raise the appropriate questions rather than think we have to provide all the right answers at the right time. I guess those of us that are looking for clear-cut rules and descriptions are going to be dissatisfied with this. But if you're seeking permission to use your imagination to explore the nature of God, you might be relieved to know that there are many faces of God. 
Now, this exchange between Moses and God is an interesting one. Let's go there for a minute. It's an illustration of our natural human desire for clarity, for specificity. How do we know? I bet that's the number one question that people ask when thinking about their experiences with God. How do we know that God is with us? How do we know that God loves us? How do we know what God wants us to do at a given time, what God expects from us? Moses is just like us. He wants answers and he's irritated with when the answers don't show up the way he wants. Listen to how Moses talks to God in this. Verse 12, you have to, you have not let me know, God. You have to let me know this. Show me your ways, he pleads. How shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight unless you go with us? You know what this reminds me of? Is when I was a teenager talking to my parents and I spout off about something and mom and dad just sit there and they just listen. And then they say, are you done yet? (laughs) My turn. (laughs) The evidence isn't strong enough for Moses that God is with him, that he will see them through whatever trial is next. The future is uncertain. The people are afraid. As the one leading the Israelites, Moses is feeling the heat of a disgruntled people whom he's shepherding, and he's calling for backup. Who among us hasn't felt that? Who among us hasn't felt scared and longed for unmistakable evidence that the presence of God will be there to see us through? We've all felt that. And rather than chastising Moses about this and the Israelites for their need for this certainty, it's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity to see ourselves and remind us that we share a lot of qualities with our biblical ancestors and remind ourselves that God loves us in spite, despite our quirks and our doubts. Chances are we can relate to the desire for confirmation that God travels with us whatever journey we go on. This is where these stories become real for us, is because we can point out, we can point out our experiences. And I like how God responds. It's 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 glorifying. God goes even further than halfway, meeting Moses halfway. God goes even further than that in response to Moses' request. God senses that Moses needs some reassurance, and God's prepared to give it. God does not say, let's talk about what God doesn't say here. God doesn't say, I'm going to walk right next to you. No, God doesn't say that. God doesn't say, go sit on that rock over there and I'm going to sit right next to you and be with you. God doesn't say that either in this. God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will make all my goodness pass before you. It's a loaded statement, isn't it? That's different than I'll sit right next to you. God says to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you. What's the implication for that? What's the implication for that? That we worship and serve and rejoice in a God who cannot be seen or experienced in conventional ways, but this is a being that encompasses all that is good in us, in the world. Even though God granted Moses a peak of of God's nature, that blast of God's glory that we see is too overwhelming for Moses to comprehend. So God says, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. Even at the, the moment when God is most present, we catch only a glimpse of the wonder of God. God lets Moses see his back. We catch only a glimpse. Friends, that might not be satisfying for you today. You know what, it might not, it's not meant to be. As unsatisfying as it may seem, we rest knowing that even if, that even if the limited experience we have of God, is this astonishing, is this amazing, then how much more wonderful is it going to be when God finally fully reveals God's self to us in that great day? How much more wonderful if, is it going to be? if we have but a glimpse of what God can do here and now and the wonderful things that we see, how much better is it going to be? Friends, that's a moment in which we look forward to. That's a moment of hope. That is a moment not to be afraid of, but a moment to rejoice in. That's why we're here. Between now and then? Between now and then? We live. We love. We serve. We keep serving. We pray. We sing. Between now and then, we take those moments, 
those glimpses, those fingerprints of God that exist all around us, and we take them in with everything we have, knowing, knowing that someday we'll see the full glory of our Lord. So maybe in the end, <clears throat> while it doesn't show the full breath of God and who God is, maybe Victor Hugo had it right. Maybe Victor Hugo had it right. Or maybe Victor Hugo was closer than we could come at this point. Maybe Victor Hugo, with that one phrase, is closer than anything that we could come up with with words. To love another person is to see the face of God. To love another person is to see the face of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we know that even in that moment when you're most present, even when we only catch a glimpse of your wonder, God, we know that even that experience is so much more than we can comprehend. We know someday, God, we will see your full glory and majesty. We will walk with you. I pray, God, that we live as people in the already but not yet, knowing full well that your kingdom will come, but there are glimpses of that kingdom here and now. May we love with abandon. May we care for those you care about. And maybe in some way, we'll see glimpses. Thank you, God, for the word today and for the message you bring. Amen.